Here's a thought experiment. A good life isn't just about having a good time, it's about having a true time. In this episode, we're going to talk about a philosophical thought experiment concerning simulated experiences. But before we do that, I have a question for you. How you doing? Really, tell me. I want to know. I know politeness dictates that you got to be like, good and you, but really, dig deep. I don't care about your day. I want to know if you're having a good life. What even makes a good life? It's a tough question, so here's a little bit of guidance. Is a good life having lots of pleasurable experiences. Is that the best situation? Here, I'll give you a second to think. If you said yes, are you sure? Hedonism is a philosophy that argues a good life is one that is filled with pleasure. Historically, hedonism has gotten kind of a bad rap. People confuse it with indulgence, vice, bacchanalian revelry, and outright sin. But a hedonistic life isn't necessarily extravagant or debaucherous. In fact, ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus, one of the first and most famous hedonists, encouraged a life of detachment and temperance. Those were his pleasures, life of the Bacchanal, then Epicurus. What this means is that how you do hedonism is determined by what you consider pleasure. There are lots of ways to determine what counts as pleasure, but for our purposes, we're gonna focus on one, preference hedonism, where pleasure is any mental state that is desired. This is just one interpretation of hedonism and simplified at that. Link doobly-doo for more. Preference hedonism says if you desire the experience of Spending all day in the ball pit at a Charles Entertainment Cheese Fine Diversion Establishment, then doing so is pleasurable for you, and that means your life is good. Counting blades of grass, playing the tuba, building a castle out of junk, all great. Hedonism ain't gonna judge. Which gets a little bleak if what's good for you is bad for others, but basically, if you're having the experiences you want, hedonism says you're good. But, are you? This brings us, drumroll please, to today's thought experiment. Philosopher Robert Nozick's experience machine an attempt to dismantle, or at least examine, hedonism from his book Anarchy, State, and Utopia. The experience machine is sort of like the ultimate virtual reality headset. Its simulations are lifelike and indistinguishable from reality, even on the neural level. No difference between you in the experience machine and, uh, well, experiences. Nozick writes that super-duper neuropsychologists could stimulate your brain so that you would think and feel you were writing a great novel, or making a friend, or reading an interesting book. All the time you would be floating in a tank with electrodes attached to your brain. He then poses the big question, should you plug into this machine for life, pre-programming your life's experiences? You can program the experience machine to give you any experience, even a whole lifetime of pleasures, even temperate and detached pleasures. Pick your poison, the point being living in the machine, you'd have more net pleasure in it than IRL. The only practical difference is what your physical body is up to. It's up to nothing. Do you do it? Do you plug in? Is that a good life? I'll give you some time to think. Time's up. Nozick says the true hedonist, who thinks a good life is pleasurable experiences, must do it. Hedonism says more pleasure equals a better life, and pleasure is any desired mental state, which is exactly what the machine produces, so plug them in. Nozick wagers, however, that most people would regard the experience machine with extreme skepticism and shouldn't plug in. Now, if you're like me, you may agree. And one of the first places your mind goes is the matrix. Fake experiences, people batteries, ignorance is bliss. But a closer analog, I think, is Total Recall, the original on Mars. Or even Philip K. Dick's short story, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, where Douglas Quayle, Quaid in the movies, elects to undergo a procedure developed by Recall Incorporated, whereby he sits in a machine and is given false memories of a trip to Mars as a secret agent. Central to the tension of the story is the question of, wait, did this really happen? Whether Quayle's experiences are true or not determines how important they are to the story. Nozick's take on the experience machine is similar. His wager is that even as card-carrying hedonists, we wouldn't just care about experiences being fun or challenging, exciting or pleasurable. We'd also care if they're true, and that is what makes them important. And broadly speaking, if that's the case, then hedonism is false, isn't it? The best life then isn't simply one with the most pleasurable experiences, but rather one with true experiences. According to Nozick, there's an appreciable difference between what one experiences and what one 
does, and that people value doing more than mental states that resemble doing. If you or I were to get into the experience machine, he may wager, upon exiting, we'd say, huh, that was fun. Shame it wasn't real, though. Another way to think about this abandons one type of machine for another. Consider Truman Burbank of The Truman Show and the well-oiled machine that is the cast and crew that works tirelessly to make his real to him, but fictional to his audience life, what it is. Up until things start to unravel, the hedonist has to say Truman has a great life. Maybe he's being lied to, but he has no idea. He's an on top of the world, lucky son of a gun. But if what we care about is truth, then we may have to say Truman's life is garbage. Even before he gets wise, those people are lying to him, perpetrating what you could call an unexperienced harm that makes his life worse even if he never directly experiences it. On the flip though, there must also be unexperienced benefits. His life could be going great even if it feels like a total poop show. People love him and respect him, they support him, though he never directly experiences it. The Truman Show charts this whole territory from unexperienced harms to unexperienced benefits and shows how a good life is not a straightforward thing. Like Nozick's Experience Machine, The Truman Show illustrates how pleasurable experiences sort of pale in comparison to what is truly the case, a thing that is often beyond experience, which is all Nozick's imagined mental pod offers. Experience, nothing else, except for maybe like nutrient goop. Everything the body needs. Which brings us actually to some interesting complications with the Experience Machine thought experiment, not having to do with nutrient goop. Well, sort of not having to do with nutrient goop. In Welfare, Happiness, and Ethics, Canadian philosopher Leonard Sumner says, it's hard to imagine anyone would abandon their body, family, friends for permanent feel-good pod residence. That even a keen hedonist would be skeptical of experience, machine, corpse, promises, the fidelity of the output, or the robustness of the tech in the case of a technological malfunction. Function. 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 Basically, if someone has family or friends, has seen a movie in 4K and thought, oh, this doesn't look all that great, or if the movie was in fact Total Recall, or The Matrix, they'd see the EM and go, uh, no thanks. A world without relations or responsibility and with perfectly trustworthy technology is totally unlike our own, alien, Sumner writes, concluding, who knows what we would choose in a world like that? Sumner says the EM becomes more fruitful if we imagine less grand illusions. He suggests imagining highly realistic movies and video games as opposed to simulated life experiences, which I mean, might not be too much of a stretch, imagining that our entertainment technology is a kind of temporary residence experience machine. And after spending some time with your Vive or getting sucked into a particularly good book, do you stop and say, well, that was great. Shame it wasn't real though. Stories and video games are not our lives, but for the moments that we're engaged with them, we may reasonably say they're experienced as part of our lives, often meaningfully, and as a mental state more so than a direct experience. By which I mean, as engrossing as Game of Thrones is, you haven't had the experience of being crushed by a phalanx, though you may feel like you have. Insofar as immersive entertainment experiences contribute to them, would we say our lives are not circumstantially, but intrinsically worse? As Sumner puts it, because those experiences aren't real? I don't think so. For one, the experience of media is just as real as unmediated experience. They're just different types of real experience, but more grandly, something doesn't have to be actual to be impactful. But wait, doesn't this bring us back to full-on hedonism? Didn't we say like two minutes ago that a good life is a true life with true experiences? <sighs> How do we reconcile all of this? Well, Sumner has an idea. He writes, the lesson of the experience machine may be not that mental state theories are deficient as accounts of the nature of welfare, but that welfare tracks only one dimension of the value of life. In other words, a good life is not comprised of only pleasurable experiences. Pleasurable experiences are just one part of a good life. The other parts, well, I'll let you figure out what those are in the comments, but if you need some help, think about what you would worry about if you were getting ready to step into the experience machine for a lifetime of detached and temperate pleasures. Let us know in the comments. I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding the ruiners of all things millennials. If you wanna watch that one, you can click here or find a link 
in the doobly-doo. We have a prep thread going for the next thing we're reading for the Idea Channel Book Club, which is The Library of Babel by Jorge Luis Borges. We're going to be discussing that on the subreddit next week. If you want to go check out the prep thread, it has some awesome supplementary material, some sort of preliminary ideas. It's really good, already super interesting. We'll put a link to that in the description too. And in case you missed it, I was on the most recent episode of The Art Assignment talking to Sarah about five of my favorite works of art, including some Robert Ashley stuff, Agnes Martin, this uh, punk rock show that I went to this one time in 1999. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the description too, and if you aren't already subscribed to The Art Assignment, you gotta. You just, you gotta. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit. Links to those also in the doobly-doo. And the tweet of the week comes from the Odin Spire who points us towards the Chrome extension that I meant to mention in last week's episode but totally forgot that turns the word millennials into snake people. Because that's what we are. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these card-carrying hedonists.